Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, today I'm going to be talking about the Pathfinder Beginner Box, uh, which is for, I'm calling it first edition because second edition is due to come out sometime this summer, I believe. And, um, and then you might be asking the question, well, then why now? You know, why would I be talking about first edition, uh, you know, box set? And there's, there's a few reasons for that. Number one, I'm quite frankly remiss in not having gotten to uh, showcasing this, uh, this box set in probably the three years that I've owned it. I've never actually played the game. Uh, I was playing Pathfinder Online between 2015 and roughly 2000, late 2016, maybe early 2017. Uh, I was a backer, uh, a Kickstart backer of that uh, of that online game, and before it had launched, I was still, you know, getting into or getting back into role playing games, and so uh, you know, tabletop role playing games. So I certainly wanted a an entry level, uh, which was this box set to the Pathfinder game system because I had never actually even heard of it before. Uh, before 2015 or so. So that's number one reason. Second reason why I think it's important to take a look at this box set now. And uh, if you don't have it, but you're looking forward to getting the Pathfinder uh, second edition, I would still recommend picking this up. And the reason being is, is that uh, if you become the kind of uh, role player uh, that I am where, you know, I've been playing for 40 years on and off between tabletop and computer RPGs and such. And, and I found that over the last almost three years, I've been repurchasing some of the older game systems that I grew up with. And so at some point, you know, now that this box set is, is roughly $30 that you can get this set, at some point, this set, you know, when they're up to Pathfinder, you know, fifth edition or sixth edition, and some new player is coming into this, they're going to want to get their hands on the earlier uh, editions of the game, or at least they might. And these will become collector's items, you know, in a sense. And, you know, what I paid $30 now, uh, 20, 30 years from now, it'll be selling on eBay or whatever equivalent of eBay will be, but, you know, then. Uh, probably for closer to a hundred. That's exactly the situation I ran in with uh, with the magenta box set, uh, the Moldve uh, set that I had for Dungeons and Dragons uh, Basic, and uh, you know I probably bought that back in the eighties for you know twenty thirty dollars, and ended up having to replace it uh, more recently for about a hundred dollars. So. Let me get into the actual box set now. So I'll go to this view here. So uh, obviously here's the box and uh, nice size. It's a, you know, good solid, you know, box as well. Brand new, obviously. So when you start digging through, you'll have all these, uh, these are counter bases. So a bunch of counter bases. It comes with uh, seven dice. You know, so all red, white lettering, very easy to see. Then we get to the uh, the hero's handbook. So it's basically the player's handbook and goes through the rules for, you know, creating a player and then, uh, I mean a character, creating a character and some, you know, some other rules that will help you out. Then there's the game master's guide. And I'm going to go through these two books in, in a little bit more detail in just a bit. We'll continue on with um, the materials that are in the box. So you get, you get starting characters, so pre-generated characters. You get a wizard, and it goes through, you know, the wizard's details, a wizard, a cleric, uh, a wizard, cleric, fighter, A rogue, 
and then the number of character sheets. So number of character sheets that you can then use to fill out, make copies of if needed. And there was something else here. Now I pulled a character sheet off offline. Um, I just like the layout a little bit better. And let's see what else came with it. So that's that. And then inside, there's a there's a play mat. So one side is just a no one side is just plain squares, kind of a sand co covered uh, colored sa uh, squares. And then here is a dungeon map. All right, and this dungeon map actually connects up with the the starter adventure that's inside. So you get that. And then there are these very, very heavy cardboard, you know, quite thick as you can see, cardboard counters, um, which I haven't, haven't removed and don't plan on removing it. So I'll keep some of those character sheets aside and throw these other items in this box for now. I'm partial to rogues, so I'm going to grab the rogue sheet. And I'll show you the character sheet that's separate. Okay. Let me just set up my camera here. So, here's the Heroes book. And uh, in my last video, I did a comparison between the Dungeons & Dragons uh, Basic Edition, uh, the Moldvay Edition uh, in 1980, uh, versus uh, the Dungeons & Dragons starter box set of 5th uh, Edition. And a fellow YouTuber had commented that... Um, you know, he was he was talking about it, do a similar thing, and then he showed off the you know this particular box set on his channel. So um, that's Jason G, and I'm going to connect a uh, in the description. I'll I'll put a tag for you to link over to his site as well. So I recommend you take a look at uh, his uh, you know his YouTube channel as well. So here is the hero's book, and some of the things that he had said in his you know I'm going to repeat here. You know, I'm, I don't mean to copy, but, um, you know, some of the points that he made are, you know, really quite, you know, quite important. So how to create a character. So it opens up here with your, you know, a very basic outline, and then there's more detail later on. And one thing that Jason had pointed out, I'm, I'm doing the same, is that it is color coded, you know, so you can see the you know the letters inside the circle refer to the sections on the blank character sheet so one is uh and i'll bring up the blank character sheet here so you can see here a is here a is also in here so choosing your class will be in section a as well when you get to b that is here when you talk about your ability scores and then here's another section on B for rolling your scores. Then 5B is also in here when you're talking about your modifiers, which are also right in this side sheet over here. So you can see each of them are tied in. Six is choosing your alignment, and so you're coming back up to box A to fill in your alignment. 7A is choosing your character name, which is also an A, and so on. So they, they really do lay this out, uh, you know, so that a new player can look at the how to create a character, the quick, quick outline of it, look at the char character sheet, and then see how those really do come together, you know, quite easily. So moving on to... Uh, you know, table of contents. So they start off with like a, a very brief scenario. 
And that's just, it's a solo adventure so that a new player can actually sit down uh, with this and actually test out playing the system and becoming comfortable with the system just themselves and, you know, a as a solo adventure. So you're both the DM and you're controlling a character and running that character through this scenario. And it's actually quite long. It's not like a short little thing here. And you're going to, you, you can see it's already, you know, onto page seven, uh, page eight. So probably about six pages worth of solo adventure. So that's, that's pretty detailed stuff. And then you'll get to an example of play. The most important part in, you know, any new box set, any new system uh, that you're encountering in is, you know, the layout of the way they have the rules set up for you. You know, very easy to understand, you know, high quality, uh, glossy paper, uh, very clear, uh, very clear instructions. Nice formatting of, of having categories and then subcategories. And just things, just the, the rules kind of pop out at you uh, in very easy detail to, uh, to see. Creating a character. And you could use the outline and, and go according to that. Or you can go here and you'll get a more in-depth description of each step that you're doing. So you're choosing your race. You're either human, dwarf, or elf. You're choosing your class. You have the four classes to choose from. And the same six abilities that you've seen in many, many different uh, RPGs, uh, especially fantasy-based RPGs. How you roll your ability scores, and so they go into that. And there's a number of ways. Uh, their system is to roll 4d6 and add together the best three numbers. So basically, you're rolling 4d6, dropping the lowest. And that's how, you know, the system that they use and then you'll write your ability scores in. There might be additional modifiers and additional house rules that your, your GM might allow you to do uh, if you're still not quite getting the, usually the character class or the, you know, matching up with the, the character race if they do have a minimum for race and class. They, they probably don't here for race. Uh, you know, they have racial bonuses but they don't have racial limits of you know the character must have this um oh uh, character race must have this but for classes they do have prerequisites and they go into races and racial traits so you have uh you know you have dwarves and their various racial traits you know, so it tells you how, how fast they are. They have dark vision. They have hatred plus one versus goblins and orcs. They're pretty hardy, having a plus two versus poisons and spells. I'm kind of down here now. Uh, weaponry, uh, weapon familiarity. What weapons are they familiar with? And the same thing for elves, the same thing with humans. Then it goes into uh, classes. So you have your cleric. You just have a few deities uh, to choose from, probably three. Yeah, so they have three. So one that's, you know, good, evil, and neutral. And they go through right into with the list of clerical spells. Fighter laid out the same way as the others. Now this, this beginner box takes you from character levels one through five. All right, so that's a slight difference from the D and D, uh, the D and D basic boxes. Whether you know whichever box set you're actually looking at, uh, you know the first three were all you know levels one to three, one to three, and one to three. At least I believe so. The Holmes, the Moldvay, and the Menser editions. Rogue, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail. So. You're getting through the character generation through most of this, all the wizard spells and one other section I wanted to go into. So they have skills and this is something different than what you have in, uh, in D and D, uh, at least in the older D and D, um, 
you know, the old school D&D ones is that you actually have skills that the character can choose from. So they select, I believe it's uh, up to three skills unless they're already specifically granted in their character class. So the character would, would gain three skills um, that they've chosen and they're based on the, they're based or tied to the particular attributes that they might have. So acrobatics is obviously dexterity, climbing is strength, bluffing is charisma, you know, and so forth. And it goes through and it talks about the difficulty levels of doing various things, you know, within those skill areas and so on. Then there are feats. Now, feats are additional abilities that you uh, your character will gain. Um, they tend to have prerequisites. So those prerequisites will be some of the skills. Uh, some of the uh, feats are tied to specific character classes. So acrobatic steps has a prerequisite of acrobat. And only fighters and thieves can... Um, can have this skill, all right? So, or rogues, I should say. Fighters and rogues can have this. Cleaving is a prerequisite strength of a 13, the power attack feature, attack bonus plus one, and once again, only a fighter can carry this uh, feature. Combat expertise, fighters and rogues. Dodging all, all four classes. So these various feats have prerequisites and are only connected to certain character classes. So, and there's, there's quite a number of them. So you start to develop a real, um, you know, a non-cookie cutter type of a, a character, even at first level. Uh, the character is going to have many different layers that you might not see in some of the more basic uh, older school RPGs. Then there's a section of playing the game. And so I, once again, this is for the player to read through and the player is going to see, well, how do I make checks? And almost all checks, you're rolling a D20 and then you're adding any character bonuses and or modifiers um, that, uh, and then additional ones that the GM might actually provide as well. So you're doing skill checks, ability checks, movements, uh, various effects of different types of lighting that the, um, that the characters might find themselves in. Uh, there's, there's a section on environments and combat. Now the combat in, in Pathfinder does have a real connection to playing with the figures on the map. Now, if you're, you know, and just like Jason G had mentioned in his video, uh, many of us are still like we're in the theater of the mind as, as he had put it. I tend not to use counters and maps uh, for the, the, for the characters to actually move their, their pawns on the map. Uh, I've had players that will map out the dungeon as they go along and they have their piece of graph paper and their pencils and stuff, you know, and such, but we never dealt with, um, movement on the map per se, or, you know, facing or any kinds of issues like that. It's just all developed in, in our imagination and, and my description to the players as to, you know, what are the conditions and features of a room that they happen to be in. And I usually write my adventures to have uh, various scenarios that are going to take place uh, that are not exactly set, you know, in a particular, you know, map location or room or, you know, anything like that. It's like as we're going along through the adventure, you know, I'll, I'll tell the characters, all right, you're walking down and, and at that moment I might feel, all right, this is a good place for this particular event to, you know, to happen. And then it gets inserted in. So it's, you know, it's not a, a complete marriage between event and location already predetermined and pre, you know, pre-planned. So it, it gives a little bit 
of flexibility uh, to make adjustments as, as you're playing along. So continuing on, there's just more in the Hero's Handbook talking about um, you know how to do the various things from casting spells to leveling up now and so on. And then the last page is obviously a gloss, glossary of terms. And then the back, I like the back here. So the back of the page, and you could easily run this off and, and give a copy to each of the players, especially if they're new. Uh, or you could have this on the back of your, uh, of your GM screen, if you make your own GM screens like, screens like I t tend to do. So there's a combat reference guide. And so this could be facing your players on your screen and so they can quickly see, all right, oh, this is my combat round sequence. These are how I make my melee attacks, my ranged attacks, my saving throws, and my skill checks. And that's basically all you really need. I mean, if, they, if you are using the map, you know, it gives you rules on flanking and, you know, cover and facing it and all of that. Or you can, like I said earlier, you can just put this in, you know, the theater of the mind. The Game Master's Guide. So the Game Master's Guide, obviously written for Game Masters. So it comes with a map for the adventure that you're going to, uh, you know, probably introduce your characters to, uh, your players to this game system. And it starts off with the adventure. So it's called Black Fang's Dungeon. And again, you know, not a short, you know, not really a short adventure. It's, uh, Probably take you a session or two to run through, uh, about 14 pages long. And then it gets into game mastering and how you actually go about, um, how you actually go about playing your role as the game master. You know, so you're, you know, you're hosting, you're a mastermind, you're a mediator, you're an actor, you're a patron. It goes through all of these aspects of what a game master actually does. Um, you'll notice there that it, it, it doesn't say adversary because the, the GM is not the adversary of the players. Um, and and it, it's also not the, you know, it's, it's also not the role of the GM to railroad the characters through um, through a particular adventure. The players have to have some ability to, you know, to flex the story. You know, even if it was a strong story set in your mind as the GM, um, you have to be prepared to, you know, to be quick on your feet and to react to certain things that the players might do that you weren't quite expecting. And it goes through the various rules and such of, you know, how to run a game, Building an adventure, so there's a whole section on building adventures. So how to write your own adventures and such, which which I have always loved about any of these, you know, these role playing games, you know, tabletop role playing games. The the systems are easy enough and and really do encourage you to write your own adventures. I know there's plenty of official, you know, published adventures out there, but um, to me, at least in my opinion you're you're really inhibiting your own you know growth and and enjoyment as a GM if you're solely using you know game products produced uh, you know and published uh, you know adventures. You really should get to writing your own. So moving on, so there's a second adventure here and, some more uh, some more details about you know traps and doors and such but what i really liked about this they go through all the various uh, magic items that that you could potentially discover just using the beginner set so all of this is geared towards levels one through five monsters same thing so there's a like a mini monsters manual and once again levels one through five Although some, like I'm sure, Black Dragon is a pretty challenging, uh, challenging creature, but maybe not to a, a group of you know fifth level 
character should be able to handle a black dragon, which tends to be the weakest of the dragons anyway. But what I really liked about this, and I'm going to get to this section here, is uh, I talk about random encounters and the location where those random encounters can, you know, so based on location, based on, you know, um, climate and geographic type features. And, and so that's a pretty neat thing. This is what I really like about this box set and, and this particular, this, uh, this Game Master's Guide. It gives you a, you know, a almost fully fleshed out starting location for your characters to begin their adventuring in. And it's Sandpoint, it's, a, you know, the, the perfect type of town because it's, it's not a massive city, but it's a, it's a port town. It's a, um, you know, it's a frontier town so that there's, you know, there's plenty of wilderness on the outside of it. And it just gives the characters or the players the, um, the real sense of I'm in a location that uh, is, is like a hub for adventuring. And, you know, that's what I really like about it is that it will create that sense of, you know, everything that we're doing in the surrounding areas. We can always come back to Sandpoint and, you know, um, heal ourselves up or, you know, just relax or spend some of our treasure meet new contacts, uh, meet new adventurers if, you know, if some had, you know, fallen, uh, you know, fallen during the, during the previous quests and such. So it really does just give the new players a real sense of getting connected to the world without being thrown into this huge, vast world. So they're, they're going to start off in a small town and you know work their way around uh the game world as as the game master develops his or her campaign setting finally the last parts of the uh the gm's guide is the uh the references so very good easy to see and understand reference charts um between combat actions once again movement actions, full round actions, standard uh, plus moves, free actions. Uh, that, that was something I didn't go into too much, but uh, that was another difference between Pathfinder and some of the earlier versions of Dungeons & Dragons is that it's split up between um, a free action and a full action. Common skill DCs, you know, so difficulty uh, checks uh, for common skills, so it gives you kind of what needs to be rolled in order to be successful and then a nice visual and descriptive um, condition rules uh, and all of the various conditions that your characters can either inflict or suffer as they're going about their adventuring and then common map symbols uh, on the very end and once again on the back as another combat reference guide so again, you can make a photocopy of this and put this on the back of your, uh, you know, on the back of your GM screen if you make them yourself, and it will have uh, very basic information, probably the most common conditions that your character can uh, can suffer or can inflict, and so it just makes it a very quick and easy reference. So. Again, I hope you enjoyed this video, and um, like I said earlier, even though Pathfinder 2nd uh, Edition is coming out soon, you know, I do highly recommend that if you don't already have this, you know, I suggest that you pick it up, especially if you're a big fan of Pathfinder, and uh, or at least potentially going to become a big fan of Pathfinder because maybe you've taken a look at some of the quick play of the Pathfinder 2. And as far as a, as far as a box set, I mean, they really do give you everything in here. Uh, they give you everything in here, not just to play for a few hours or, you know, a couple, you know, a couple sessions. They give you everything that you need to, you know, probably play for, 
you know, several months, if not a full year, bringing your characters from level one through, you know, level five and giving you all the tools that you need to make your own adventures and to uh, build upon the setting that they give you and to expand, expand on the, and the growing, you know, ever expanding world that it has. So, um, you can function quite some, you know, for quite some time uh, with this uh, beginner's beginner's box. So this might actually be the gold standard of beginner's boxes, at least in my experience. I'm going to take a look at a few of the other ones that I do have. But at present moment, this is the gold standard. So Pathfinder, RPG, first edition, box set, still about $30.00. Might come down in price during the summer when when second edition comes out. Um, I don't think it'll jump right to eBay and start skyrocketing in price. So you might want to jump on it uh, while it's still around that thirty dollar range. So again, thanks for joining in. Hope you liked the video. If you did, please hit the like button. If you haven't uh, decided to subscribe yet, uh, please consider subscribing. Uh, the more traffic that I get in, the better it is for the channel, uh, the more exposure the channel gets. Please leave your questions and comments. Uh, any suggestions that you have, uh, please feel free to leave your suggestions. I seriously consider suggestions that come in. Uh, as you can see, I've had this, this back and forth exchange of ideas with uh, Jason G. And I'm go going to connect his uh, or link his channel uh, in the description of this here as well. And, uh, you know, for, for us small time YouTubers here, you know, with these channels that are, that are fairly young, um, my, my channel is still less than three years old, um, probably just a little over two years old and, um, exchanging ideas with each other and, and just, you know, uh, supporting each other as far as, you know, taking a look at each other's content and, you know, corresponding with each other and, you know, putting out the games and, you know, videos that we all have a common interest in. So again, thanks for joining. I hope you have the rest of your weekend. It's Memorial Day weekend. So, um, you know, my, my father was a World War II vet, passed away uh, a couple years ago. I'll be making the trip out to the uh, cemetery tomorrow uh, to give him a visit. And, uh, you know, this Memorial Day, you know, please remember to, uh, you know, to just think a little bit about the, the people that had sacrificed everything, uh, whether they, you know, passed in combat or passed, you know, long after uh, they had retired from the military. Uh, so it's just a day to, you know, to honor uh, and, and not just, uh, you know, not just American soldiers, you know, from my point, I mean, you know, the wars that, you know, the war that my father fought in was, you know, fought with uh, all of the allied, um, you know, soldiers. And, and so a, uh, you know, a remembrance, a day of remembrance for them as well. So whether it be Canadian or Australian or English or French or, you know, any of those that, uh, you know, that my father had uh, come into contact with and served with, you know, I thank you for your service. I thank you for your sacrifices and, uh you know, Godspeed. All right. Thanks for joining. I uh, look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen sometime in the near future.